This is episode 10 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and to get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash shajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've already done that, please consider leaving up this podcast, a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 21, Undermining Government Credibility, Fall 2016. It was a mid-August storm. Waves crashed at Foster Beach on Chicago's North Shore. Josh, Jillian, Eva, and Andy dug into the sand on the beach's southern corner. Their hole was large, rectangular, 16 feet long and 5 feet wide. The long side paralleled the shoreline. The sand was piled on one end. All four were drenched with sweat. Even with the cool spray from the waves hitting them, the hole was dug a dozen feet from the shore, just at the edge of the wave of action. The bottom of the hole was filled with water, and weaker waves broke into the trench. They had gotten the trench almost four feet deep. There they are, Eva pointed out over the water at a bobbing light. Josh pulled out his flashlight and made three quick bursts of light. Andy sprinted off towards the parking lot, a hundred yards to the southwest. Ready? Josh put down his shovel and slipped out of his boots. Let's go. Jillian followed Josh's lead. Everyone donned masks and latex gloves under leather work gloves. Ava walked back to the grass of the park just behind the beach. Before long, Andy's truck glided over the lawn, lights off, the engine barely audible over the waves and wind. He swung the truck around, backing until his tailgate was near the edge of the park. Eva jumped into the back of the truck, stepped over the half-dozen sandbags in the bed, and grabbed a large nylon rope and full trash bag. She left the looped end of the rope over the trailer hitch and started playing it out as she walked towards the beach. She dropped the trash bag on the edge of the trench, jumped in and crawled out the other side. She made her way to the water's edge where Jillian was waiting. All set? asked Eva. Yeah, it's hard to hold it in the water, but it'll work. Jillian took the rope and waded back out to Josh, who was fighting to guide the MPC towards the beach. She threw the line over the canister, and Josh passed it back underneath. She held the canister while he dove down. The rope floated up, and she passed it back over to him over the top. They looped the rope six times before reaching the end with the carabiner, which they fastened to the hoisting lug on the MPC's end. By this time, the canister had nearly washed ashore. They managed to spin the cylinder in the water, putting a few more loops around the circumference. Okay? Eva asked. Jillian was breathing hard but grinned. Let's hope this works. The three of them pulled and pushed the canister into a place on the shore directly beneath their trench. Everybody got out of the way, and Eva waved up at Andy, who was waiting in the truck. The little Toyota moved forward, taking the slack out of the big rope. It hesitated as it started to pull the canister, but it only needed enough force to pull the seven-ton MPC up a slight incline, eased by the mechanical advantage of the rope looped over the cylinder. The sandbag in the truck's bed gave the rear wheels better traction. The diggers had moved behind and started pushing the canister. The tires dug in as the MPC started to move, but then caught as it gained momentum. The steel tube rolled right up and into the pit more easily than anyone had expected. The team jumped up and down in excitement, but otherwise kept quiet. Andy came down from the truck carrying a large pipe wrench and a four-foot-long pipe. He tightened the wrench on the first of the eight bolts holding the lid on the top of the canister and pulled. Nothing happened. He slipped the pipe over the handle of the wrench and tried again. The bolt gave against the long lever arm, and once it was loose, Andy moved on to the next bolt as Jillian worked the first one the rest of the way out with her gloved fingers. At the same time, Josh and Eva worked to free the rope from under the canister. The soft sand made it easy to pull the end of the line through. By the time they were done, Andy and Jillian had loosened the last bolt. Hold on, don't pull that lid, Eva said. Let's get some sand on the lakeside so when we open it up, waves wash sand and water in instead of just water. Jillian, can you grab that bag? All four shoveled sand. When they pulled the lid, the water and sand rushed into the empty cavity. Jillian tossed bits of garbage into the stream. Where'd you get all this stuff, Eva? My aunt is a hoarder, and we helped her clean out her house last spring. I was surprised that I had use for an old vanilla Coke can. I've never heard of that, said Andy. Yeah, they only made it for a few years, and this is an early can. Huh, I wonder if they'll figure that out. We'll see how sharp they are. The team quieted down as they worked to shovel sand and bits of late 1990s and early 2000s trash into the canister. With the wind rising and waves washing higher on the beach, the canister was quickly filled to the level of the surrounding sand. They wedged the lid into the trench to look like it had worked itself off. The last thing to do was to fill in around the MPC. By the time they had finished, the top of the cylinder was barely visible, and waves continued to wash up where it lay. Headline, Third Abandoned Nuclear Canister Found on Chicago Shoreline. August 24, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. Following the large storm on Sunday and Monday, beachgoers at Foster Beach on Chicago's North Shore discovered another multi-purpose container, MPC, used to store spent nuclear fuel buried in the sand. 
Kenny Jessup, 43, of Andersonville, was the first to encounter the large steel canister as he walked his dog early Tuesday morning. I saw this big metal lip and rounded sides going under the sand, he said in a television interview with ABC7. I walked this way almost every day, and I'd never seen it before. But I guess the storm washed some sand out. I started pushing sand off it with my foot. I couldn't believe how long this thing was. By the time I got a bit more sand off it, a few other people had showed up. We were pulling more sand off it when someone uncovered the radiation label on the side. You should have seen how fast we all backed up off it. One bystander called the police, and another posted a picture to Twitter, alerting the local media. It did not take long for news outlets and social media to link the canister to the other two found in the Chicago area earlier this month. The first NPCs were found along the Illinois River, near Braidwood, Dresden, and LaSalle Nuclear Generating Stations. This is the first canister found on the shore of Lake Michigan. On the forum website Reddit, users were quick to point out that Foster Beach is less than six miles from the Deaver Water Crib, a water intake on Lake Michigan that provides much of the Chicago area's drinking water. Using the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's GNOME software, General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment, users have predicted that if nuclear contaminants were released on Foster Beach, they would have entered both the Deaver and 68th Street water cribs. It would take surface-borne particles less than 14 hours to reach the Deaver water crib from Foster Beach, with prevailing north-northwestern currents moving at a little less than usual half mile per hour. The data and projections from Reddit users were tentatively confirmed by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, but a spokesperson cautioned against panic and stated that the laboratory would be releasing a formal statement as soon as a large-scale model could be created. Officials from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, still in the area conducting an investigation on the first two MPCs, also arrived on the scene. They assured local law enforcement, the media, and bystanders that they did not detect dangerous levels of radiation. Although their Geiger counter did register slightly higher readings than its typical for background radiation, they said it was well within safe levels. You get more radiation flying on a plane, said one NRC official. If you flew from New York to London 15 times, you'd get about a half a millisievert. Every year we're getting about 6 millisieverts just being alive. If you stood on this spot, you'd get a little less radiation than flying. It's not nothing, but it isn't worth immediate concern. NRC investigators have not released their findings on the first NPCs found west of Chicago. Their spokesperson did say they were making progress and would have information ready for the public in a matter of weeks. Headline. Investigators identify decommissioned Zion Nuclear as origin for abandoned fuel canisters. September 3rd, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. Investigators from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have been in the Chicago area since abandoned spent fuel canisters were found in the Illinois River on August 7th. Multipurpose containers, MPCs, are 15-foot long, 4-foot wide stainless steel cylinders used to hold nuclear fuel that has cooled sufficiently to be stored indefinitely. These canisters are usually housed in larger concrete cylinders to help shield the surroundings from radiation and the MPCs from damage. On August 7th, a volunteer crew cleaning the Illinois River west of Joliet, Illinois, found a canister buried in the riverbank. Five days later, another canister was found farther down the Illinois River, near Seneca, Illinois. On August 24th, a third MPC was found on Chicago's North Shore at Foster Beach. The NRC investigators have been attempting to trace the origin of these canisters. Spokespeople for each of the six nuclear generating stations within 100 miles of Chicago denied that the MPCs had originated from their facilities, citing the high security, detailed inventory, and other safety measures meant to thwart the theft or damage of nuclear materials in their care. NRC investigators held a news conference yesterday afternoon to describe their methods and findings. Each canister was excavated and examined for identifying characteristics such as serial numbers or labels. The soil surrounding and inside of the containers was also examined for clues. Both the MPCs and surroundings were checked for residual radiation levels. The first portion of their press conference emphasized how little radiation was being given off by the now empty MPCs. The NRC investigators stressed the lack of risk these canisters posed to the public. They also noted that if they had been dumped with nuclear fuel, the MPCs would have been found sooner as, quote-unquote, major biological disruption would have occurred, meaning the noticeable die-off of plants and animals in the area, which did not occur. The investigators identified Zion Nuclear Power Station as the source of the three MPCs. Officials for Energy Solutions, the company overseeing operations at Zion, have previously denied that the thefts could have happened at their facility. However, in July, an anonymous whistleblower notified the press that MPCs had gone missing in recent inventory. At the time, a company spokesperson stated that the error had occurred when they digitized their inventory system two decades ago. Energy Solutions declined to make a spokesperson available for this story before it went to press. Zion Nuclear Power Station is located 40 miles north of Chicago on Lake Michigan, nestled in the middle of Illinois Beach State Park. 
The station was built in the early 1970s. Its two reactors came online in 1973 and 74. In 1998, a control rod was inserted too deeply into one of the reactor cores and then withdrawn. Out of safety concerns, the reactor was shut down. The second reactor was down at the time for refueling. The estimated cost to repair the damage was higher than the expected revenue for the remainder of the facility's life. Zion was closed, and the company Energy Solutions has been tasked with dismantling the site by 2026. Headline, Zion officials deny spent fuel canister theft. September 4th, 2016. Chicago, Wired News Agency. One day after the Nuclear Regulatory Commission identified Zion Nuclear Power Station as the source of the recently discovered spent fuel containers abandoned near the Chicago area waterways, a spokesperson for the facility denied culpability in a written statement. Quote, the multi-purpose containers found near Chicago in the last month pose a grave concern for nuclear safety. Nevertheless, all of the MPCs on our facility property are accounted for. We acknowledge that we had an earlier accounting error. The fact is, during a recent inventory this summer, handwritten counts were misread during data entry. We identified a discrepancy of six MPCs. We repeated the inventory and corrected the error. No inventory was missing, and the findings of the NRC investigators must be in error. We will be providing full cooperation with investigators to clear up this mistaken attribution. This statement contradicts a previous press release in which the inventory error occurred in the 1990s when their database was digitized. The spokesperson for Energy Solutions would not respond to our request for comment on this discrepancy. Headline, Public Outcry Over Bungled Nuclear Container Investigation, September 5, 2016, Chicago, Wired News Agency. Protesters have appeared at many of Chicago's official functions in the last few days. What started as a few picketers outside of a city council meeting and harsh criticisms during the open question period has spread to events where the mayor or other city officials are speaking. In front of the water management office on State Street, DePaul students, who share a building with the office, have created what has been termed an art installation at the entry of the office, replete with Homer Simpson dolls, rebar, and metal drums painted with glow-in-the-dark green paint, as well as papier-mâché replicas of Zion Nuclear Power Station with an unidentified substance oozing into the lake. At Zion, the plant where the abandoned nuclear containers originated according to an NRC investigation, protesters have appeared at the gate, accosting workers coming in and out of the facility. A spokesperson for Zion's operating company, Energy Solutions, commented that they have stepped up facility security both around the spent fuel containers as well as at the gate to protect the grounds from protesters. Headline, Public Fears Nuclear Contamination of Drinking Water, September 6, 2016, Chicago, Wired News Agency. After another empty spent fuel canister was found, this time near one of Chicago's primary drinking water sources, public outcry and concern has grown over the possible radioactive contamination of municipal water. Today, Chicago's Water Management Office has released a statement which was meant to allay fears, according to the office's spokesperson. The document, though, has had the opposite effect, as it failed to state the city's water is safe to drink. Quote, the city of Chicago and this office hold public safety as our paramount interest. Clearly, the unauthorized and illegal dumping of containers that was used to hold spent nuclear fuel in both the Illinois River and the Chicago shoreline is a cause for concern, and we are working around the clock to identify and mitigate any contaminants in the municipal water system. We should reiterate the findings of the NRC's investigators. No evidence exists at this time suggesting that nuclear fuel entered the environment near our water intakes. The canisters register only slight levels of radioactivity. Furthermore, the type of radioactive elements that would have been present, namely iodine, 131 has a short half-life and would have decayed significantly before entering the water system, end quote. Critics have pointed out that current water treatment regimen has no process in place to clean radioactive contaminants from the Lake Michigan water used by the system. Radioactivity alarms would only detect high levels of contamination, not lower ones that might cause long-term injury. Furthermore, cesium-134, another potential contaminant, has a much longer half-life and could be absorbed by fish and other life forms that consume water where it's present as has happened off the coast of Japan following the Fukushima Daiichi disaster in 2011. Headline, Abandoned Fuel Canisters Proved to be Older Than First Reported, September 9, 2016. Chicago, Wired News Agency. Doubt was cast on the recent statements of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission investigators, who argued that the spent fuel canisters found in the Illinois River and Lake Michigan shoreline were dumped recently. An inventory of the contents of the canister found at Foster Beach along Chicago's North Shore revealed trash dating from the early to mid-2000s only. This suggests to critics that the canister was deposited before this time. The lid came off, and it was filled with contemporaneous refuse through wave action. State archaeologist Dr. Don Brody has made public comments on the growing controversy, citing her profession's expertise with dating items based on the layers in which they are found. In a recent interview, Dr. Brody stated, quote, 
We know that a layer must be contemporaneous with or younger than the newest artifact contained within it. We call this terminus post quem, meaning time after which. In this case, it appears that the newest artifact contained within the canister is a Coke vanilla can. It's one of the early cans from the production runs between 2002 and 2005. This tells us that the filling in of the canister cannot predate 2002. It doesn't, however, tell us the upper range of the event. The law of superposition says that one thing being buried under something else is older. We don't have a layer on top of the canister, so we can't be sure of the upper limit of its deposit. But as no trash from any time after 2005 entered the canister, it's a reasonable supposition that the canister was filled around that time. In fact, a majority of the trash comes from 2004 and 2005, making that the most likely time frame for the canister to have been filled. It does not tell us when the container was placed, though. For example, the inner sand could have been deposited last week with an assemblage of trash from 2000 to 2005, out of pure coincidence but this seems extremely unlikely." End quote. This complicates the depositional timeline of the multipurpose containers, MPCs. Until this point, it appeared the MPCs could have been gone missing from Zion Nuclear Power Plant 40 miles north of Chicago this summer, as six canisters were first reported as missing in July. This undermines the NRC's position and has caused prominent local leaders to question other aspects of their investigation. Headline, Administrators of Zion Nuclear Power Testify on Abandoned Canisters. September 16th, 2016. Washington, Wired News Agency. Representatives from Energy Solutions, the company responsible for overseeing the decommissioning of the Zion Nuclear Power Plant, were summoned to appear before a joint meeting of the House Committees on Energy and Commerce, Homeland Security, and Science, Space, and Technology. If previous statements of committee members are any indication, the CEO of Energy Solutions, Todd Ackerman, will face harsh criticisms and questions into the apparent illegal dumping of nuclear fuel canisters. Transcript excerpt of Congressional Testimony. Chairman of the Joint Committee, Tim Murphy, Republican, Pennsylvania. So you're telling me, sir, that an unidentified group broke into the Zion nuclear power station, stole half a dozen seven-ton MPCs, and hid them around Chicago? For what purpose? Mr. Todd Ackerman, CEO of Energy Solutions. We do not know the purpose. Chairman Murphy. A whistleblower, uh, let me see, Mr. Adams, said that six containers went missing sometime in the summer of 2016. You released a statement saying that those MPCs were not missing, but there had been a transcription error from when the plant's records were digitized. Later, you said that written inventory counts have been misread from a clipboard due to poor handwriting. Now you're saying the canisters were stolen by some group? Mr. Ackerman, correct. Chairman Murphy, can you explain how they were stolen? The MPCs require a truck to transport them. Mr. Ackerman, we do not know how the canisters were stolen at this time. No trucks with enough capacity to carry six canisters left the plant in the last year, and we have security tapes to prove that. Chairman Murphy, can you imagine it another way? Mr. Ackerman, no, a machine would have had been needed, and these things are not exactly small. We have 24-7 security on site, and no irregularities that large were reported during the time we think the canisters were stolen. Chairman Murphy, what about small irregularities? Mr. Ackerman, we did find minor fence damage near where the canisters had been stored. Chairman Murphy, wasn't that a red flag for you? Mr. Ackerman, well, no, it was between the canisters and Lake Michigan. I don't see how the MPCs could have been moved out that way. Chairman Murphy, couldn't they have been pulled to the water? Mr. Ackerman, I think that would take a very large boat, not to mention the disturbance it would cause. Our security guards are not sleeping on the job. We have public beaches on either side of the plant. Something like that would have been seen. Chairman Murphy, how do you explain the fact that the spent fuel canisters contained debris from the mid-2000s? Was this not the same period when you were emptying the spent fuel pool? Did these imaginary thieves have a time machine too? Mr. Ackerman, garbage exists in the environment. Anybody who has walked along the beach knows that, so the NPCs might have been filled with garbage from many decades. Chairman Murphy, sir, doesn't it seem odd, if your scenario is true, and it was dumped in the last few months, that no garbage from after 2005 was found inside? Mr. Ackerman, I'm not an expert on garbage. I, I don't know. Chairman Murphy, it seems to me, logically, that if most of the garbage dates from 2000 to 2005 and nothing afterwards, it must have been filled on or after 2005, but not that long. It clearly wasn't sitting on the surface of the beach. It's too popular and people would have seen it. Can I suggest an alternate scenario? A simpler explanation that fits the facts? Zion is decommissioned. It will only generate debt from now on. So someone made a decision to ditch a bit of the spent fuel to save money. The fuel is simply loaded on trucks, driven out, and dumped near other power stations to confuse investigators. Right now, you're saying the fuel is accounted for. But you also said, until evidence surfaced proving otherwise, that the missing canisters were accounted for. Forgive me for saying so, but so many changes in your account strains credulity, and I have trouble believing anything you say now. 
Mr. Ackerman. Sir, first of all, no fuel is missing. Dumping fuel like that would have caused massive die-off in the surrounding biota, enough to get people's attention. It simply isn't possible. These appear to be empty containers only. Chairman Murphy, why would just empty containers be dumped? Mr. Ackerman, sir, I'm not the responsible party. How would I know? Chairman Murphy, excuse me, but you are in charge of that facility, and therefore its security is your responsibility. Mr. Ackerman, I'm sorry. I meant I'm not part of the group that did this, so I don't I don't know their reasoning. End of transcript. End of chapter. End of chapter 10 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.